Thank you. So I, I wanted to talk about this uh, exhibition about chroma, ancient, uh, ancient uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the, I wanted to talk about this exhibition uh, and our journey through it. And uh, the exhibition was a collaboration between our science department, uh, imaging, uh, conservation, and a group of scholars, uh, Vincennes uh, Brinkman and his wife, Ulrike Hulk Brinkman. And the collaboration on this project was to create a recreation of this uh, Sphinx, uh, color accurate, uh, and, and to explain how, to people how this may have been colored in the past. And our first, uh, our first challenge was this piece was trapped inside its case. Uh, through, due to safety reasons, it wasn't able to be removed. Um, so the goal was to make a 3D printed facsimile. So we started with scanning uh, up upon that stele, a plaster cast. And you know that was because we could reach the entire piece. And that was a Leo scanner. But because this was about color, we felt it necessary to try and capture the entire piece. And uh, I run a team of 13 photographers and six imaging specialists that split between post-production and 3D imaging. And this is one of our photographers. Our first step in this process is to photograph and document traditional 2D photography of, of the objects. Uh, and I wanted to show some examples because when we look at 3D imaging and 2D imaging, it's important that the quality bar that we've set over the past 150 years it needs to stay there. We don't want to drop the quality as technology ch changes and evolves. So in uh, November 2020, this was uh, our first test uh, to photograph the piece and our first crack at doing photogrammetry from only the front of the case. And we felt that if we could capture the front of the object and then apply the color to the uh, the scan uh, from on top of the stele, we could at least get part of the object covered. But we felt that wasn't enough, and we basically set out to test using a little miniature gimbal camera, a DJ, DJI Osmo, to reach into the case and image photogrammetry from the back. And so uh, that we did an initial test, and that worked out well. So we basically went to capture the entire piece from inside the case and outside the case. Then using reality capture, we brought together those two image sets. And you know, it's interesting, you can see the camera positions buried inside the case there. And uh, we had a success. Uh, it, it was really phenomenal just to be able to uh, image this object at all. And that object then was sent over to uh, Frankfurt, Germany, where the Brinkmans uh, contracted a 3D print to be created in pieces. It was put together. And then in the meantime, in our, you'll see a little timeline on the bottom. Uh, this is not the only project we were working on, so this project rode alongside other projects. But we took an opportunity to test different uh, different things we could do in-house with the content. As this project progressed, the science team and conservation team started their work to basically uncover the pigment that is on that piece. And because this couldn't leave the gallery and couldn't leave its case, you'll see that we had to create a box because there were UV, uh, IR and other investigative techniques, multi-band imaging. And so the team would, once every few months, put this box up and imaging would continue. And here I'm showing some of the scientific analysis findings. Um, you have micros microscopy, XRF, and a scanning electron microscopy that was uh, produced on this object, again, in the gallery. Then alongside this work, that information was being fed over to Frankfurt, 
where uh, the Brinkmans were translating these uh, identified colors onto the object and onto the recreation. And then came a time in the project where um, the recreation was in uh, Frankfurt, but we had to start working on a uh, augmented reality application uh, that would be a public facing feature of this exhibition. And uh, one of the challenges is we had to try and remotely train uh, the Brinkmans on how to capture for photogrammetry. And, uh, you know, this was all through teams of very much during pandemic lockdown times. Uh, and, and that was a fun exercise of just sharing best practice. And uh, before the show opened, this show opened in uh, July 22. Uh, so be before April, uh, before just a few weeks, we didn't have access to the final object. So we once more worked with the Brinkmans to remotely uh, digitize and send us the data sets from the cameras. The problem there, and this is where the standards start coming in, is that uh, we did not have access to the original. We only had their photographs. Uh, while we sent color charts, we had really no control of the situation. Um, but we did have the pigment samples. So we relied on measuring lab color samples from the pigments and translating them to our RGBs. Then uh, we created that model and you'll see the, uh, some of the pieces had to be recreated. That, that metal element on top was not coming through in the photogrammetry. Then our team started mapping the color findings all of the scientific photography onto the 3D model. And the result was three reconstructions, three digital reconstructions. The current object, the original uh, photogrammetry session of the object as it is. Then the science-based reconstruction, which is essentially the colors that our scientists agree existed on that piece based on the, the pigments. Um, found on the object. And then the experimental reconstruction is the Brinkmans adding their scholarship of many, many years digging into this topic of poly polychromy on Greek and Roman sculpture. And that's the final model. And, you know, it was interesting because the translation of the lab color values was spot on. When we received this piece and brought it in, uh, we were really happy to see that the color translated correctly, even though we never had that piece in our possession. Um, I wanted to talk about the standards component of what we do. In this case, uh, the idea of using that little pocket gimbal camera was actually something we started testing a few years earlier um, in Egypt to try and do remote photogrammetry. This is before uh, object capture and it's, you know, it's even gotten easier now. But that camera was a, a really interesting tool because it creates a DNG file and therefore we can do our color calibration procedure the same as on a DSLR. Um, and, and that's where our standards come in. So for many years we worked on uh, during the film to digital transition um, in two dimensions, we had to resolve how to manage color in the museum industry. And here uh, we use a process, uh, well, a standard called ISO 19264. And in the case of the Sphinx, which was two different lightings, uh, two different camera technologies completely, we're able to calibrate those two cameras together and know uh, the groove that they were running in. Um, and as an example, if you took those same cameras and didn't calibrate them, um, they would be wildly uncontrolled. And so, you know, this is, uh, this is a staple of museum imaging. Uh, another area that was interesting about this project was the, uh, the fact that when the UV and IR and visible technical imaging was happening, um, we found that the conservation departments in our industry use all different brands of light sources and there really are no firm standards for this type of imaging. So uh, we developed a multi-band image light, uh, an LED fixture, and that played a role into this uh, project. And what's interesting about this is it's such a narrow market, we're deciding to make that an open source spec for the whole community. 
So that's something we're working. I know the last presentation about legal issues and all that, like how to make something like this open source. Um, but we envision just providing this spec sheet and the plans to say, here, make it yourself. Um, but we've rolled those lights out internally across the whole museum, which uh, has quite a few conservation departments. The other uh, innovation, which is very practical, is uh, when we first imaged, we tried to come up with some sort of articulated stand to safely hold the camera around this ancient artwork. And uh, we basically developed a articulated photogrammetry stand that uh, is much like a dentist arm, and it's phenomenal. It saves us so much time. Um, and again, we're able to share that with the rest of the community. Well, you know, the primary reason to do all this was to share all of this information with the public. So uh, the museum contracted a company called Blue Cadet, and they built an AR experience using our data on the eighth wall uh, platform. The primary reason was to make it accessible across all platforms. Um, the nice thing is all of those still photos you saw, all of the science imaging is overlaid on the model. Our team did all the mapping um, and Blue Cadet did the, uh, the content. We also started taking the 3D model of the original piece um, to our website. If you look at the website, there's only a couple 3D models. We're very carefully uh, working through how to distribute our content. But in this case, uh, this uh, piece is uh, presented in Model Viewer. We're hosting a USD and a GLB. Uh, someday, I hope we could just post USD. But one of the most interesting aspects of this project for me personally has been um, how the USD and the USDZ format have allowed us to start using uh, and sharing this content to, to the broader public. So in this case, uh, and the, this was a few months ago, we had an education program right in the gallery with the piece there. We talked about our process and you know we threw iPads here with uh, Procreate software and brought those color palettes and, and these little kids just dove right in with almost you know, no barrier, no training, and they can take those files home with them, pass them along. Um, we're also doing STEAM education for teachers where we're testing uh, training on photogrammetry and showing people how they can do their own AR on accessible platforms. And this is a, a photograph of the whole team. Um, and when I think of open source, I think of collaboration and through this whole project, through the pandemic, it was teams calls and meetings with scientists and meetings with curators and conservators. And I envision a time when we can collaborate uh, more seamlessly on technology based products because it was very linear, very much passing files back and forth instead of collaborating on systems real time. Um, and, and this is where I see USD as a very interesting, uh, by the way, I joined uh, the community through the interest in USD. Um, we see it as more than a file format. The, uh, the industry adoption is wide. The open source is attractive. The fact that it was built, the DNA was built for creative collaboration is fascinating. Um, and everyone I've met in this community is so passionate and uh, so deeply involved and so reactive. When we have a problem and we say, can, can this be done? Five people call me back and say, yes, and in two weeks it's done. Um, and I'm contrasting that to ISO standards, which take years and years. So it's a really interesting thing coming in new, how quickly this is evolving. Um, and I do want to point out USDZ is something that's very interesting because the fact that you can bring all that content together into a, a one file and distribute that information is fascinating. And uh, my first introduction to that uh, was creating this object. Uh, it's a Zemi figure from uh, our collection. And when we heard that you could put audio into a USDZ file and interactivity, uh, we set out to take a narration from a curator, some text and interactivity um, in Spanish and English, 
along with that 3D asset. And, and that, to me, is so amazing because you can pass that file around and it's as if you have a curator over your shoulder. And anyone can make this. And, and I feel there's a great opportunity to expand on this idea of collecting information and sharing information in open ways. So we're trying to step into this conversation very actively, very proactively. Uh, we've written technical papers, we're doing presentations, we're participating in this community. Um, we want to directly engage with the knowledge that's in this room because there's so many things we don't know. Um, then uh, this field testing, we've found so many cases of parts of this that aren't working yet that need help. And um, the one thing that I think we can do as uh, the Met is to work on creating reference data sets that we can share with this community and others. Um, not just the high-res 3D file, but the 2D photography of that same object, audio tracks, additional content. Um, so if we think of these as data collections from the Met that could be used as reference, it would be very interesting to accelerate working through the kinks because right now I would say we can't do a straight line USD pipeline for cultural heritage, but I think we're getting closer each day. And then of course, as we solve these problems, to turn it around and turn it into education, uh, that would be really uh, a benefit to everyone, I believe. This open dialogue is just, just in this room, we've had so many conversations today that are solving problems. That's it, thank you.